Hi, my name is Peter Björk. In this video, I'll cover an overview of identity and access management. If you Google identity and access management, you often get a definition similar to this one. Identity and access management is the security discipline that enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right time for the right reasons. That sounds easy enough, but embedded in that sentence is quite a lot. We need to manage the life cycle of users. We need to make sure the user is who the user claims to be. We must think about ease of access for our users. Access management doesn't mean it must be hard to gain access, just that the access must fulfill our security policies. Let's have a closer look at the components that build a typical enterprise identity and access management solution. First, we need a user store. This is often based on Active Directory, but doesn't have to be. Secondly, quite early on, companies invested in some single sign-on or SSO capabilities. These were often focusing on internal applications and used non-standard methods of achieving single sign-on. But once the company started to interact more with external parties, such as partners and uh, software as a service SaaS applications, federation was needed. These solutions very much are built on standards and you can integrate products from many different vendors because of that. Closely tied to SSO and federation are the need for multi-factor authentication or MFA. With the use of MFA, we can have a higher trust level in who the user is. With the ever-growing catalog of application, directories, partners and SaaS applications, we need something that can help with the life cycle of the users. Many companies have tied their user life cycle to their human resource management system. And lastly, we need capabilities to monitor and audit our identity and access management solution to make sure the right person has the right access at the right time and for the right reasons. Let's move on with some common vocabulary. The first one is an easy one. Authentication. Authentication is the act of proving who you are. It is often referred to as AuthN. Typically, authentication is done by the use of username and password or a certificate. To gain a higher trust level in the authentication, you can use things like multi-factor authentication. Authorization. Once the user has authenticated, authorization decides what the user have access to. Authorization is often written as AuthZ. As an example, you authenticate into your domain joined Windows machine. Once logged in, you open a file share and browse the content. Your access to that content is your authorization. At the beginning of Mankind, when developers were asked to create an application, the developers started out investigating the business requirements and starting coding the business logic. Pretty soon they realized they need some method of separating different users from each other. The reason could be to store individual user settings and preferences, or controlling access to data and so on. So developers had to create a user store within the application. In order to know who the user were, the developers had to create some method of authentication and roles and rights engine. Each new application required this. Of course, the code could be reused, but what happened if username and password weren't good enough anymore? Perhaps you require certificate-based authentication instead. Now each application must be changed and updated. And to make it worse, the developers who mainly cared about the business logic is now in charge of protecting the user store and to make sure it's not being hacked or become corrupted. Using a local method for authentication is painful for developers. End users must enter username and password for each application, often resulting in weak passwords or the reuse of passwords. And lastly, it's painful for the administrators. First, they must create users in each application. Secondly, if someone leaves, they must disable the user in each one of the applications. To solve this, we have for a long time had claim-based access. 
In the claim-based model, the developer replaces the authentication logic in the application with a simpler logic that can accept a claim. And trust is established between the application and a source of authentication and authorization. In this case, I call it an identity provider or IDP. The application will happily accept the claim that is sent from the IDP. The application may still have a local user store for user settings and access rights, but the application does not have to handle any passwords since the users never authenticate directly into the application. The user authenticate into the identity provider instead, and when users wants to access the application, a claim or access token is generated by the identity provider and sent to the application. The identity provider can issue claims to all your applications. Claim-based access is much simpler for the developers because they do not have to create a strong authentication method, nor do they have to protect the user's passwords. If a change in authentication method is needed, you change it on the identity provider and the application remains unmodified. Users are super happy. They can be authenticated once into the identity provider and with that gain seamless access into all their applications. Administrators are also happy. If a user leaves the company, the administrator can disable the user in the identity provider and immediately access to all application has been revoked. Let's try to use a common scenario to explain the concept of a claim a little more in depth. Imagine you are about to go on a trip and you decided to fly to the destination. When you arrive at the airport, you walk up to the check-in counter. Here you provide proof of purchase of the ticket and you authenticate with the help of your passport. The check-in personnel validates your credentials and issue you a boarding pass. This is your claim and the check-in counter is the identity provider. You walk through security and when it's time to board you show your boarding pass to the personnel at the gate. The gate trusts the check-in counter. Therefore it accepts what the boarding pass claims. For example, my name, my frequent flyer status, which plane I'm supposed to board. The boarding pass is signed, so the gate knows the claim hasn't been tampered with. And in today's world of flying, the gate trusts multiple different identity providers. The gate trusts the check-in kiosk, and many times also web check-in. In a claim-based access model, trust is at the heart. In order for it to work, the application must trust the identity provider. How you establish trust varies depending on which standard you use. Often is trust built with the help of exchanging certificates. When you create the trust, you are often asked to use something referred to as the metadata. This is typically a file or a link to a file. The application shares its metadata with the identity provider and the identity provider shares its metadata with the application. Using a metadata file simplifies the establishment of trust. The metadata often contains the certificate, login and logout URLs, and what else parameters each system supports or requires. Not using a metadata file requires you to manually enter these parameters. For some standards, you do not use a certificate. Instead, you use something like a system username and password. Now we have a better understanding of claim-based access. But as I mentioned before, in most cases, we still need user objects in the applications. Today, many companies use a centralized human resource system to create and manage their users. This system can provision users into the identity provider. And then, the identity provider can provision the users into the application. But for larger enterprises, a more centralized system is needed. Most enterprises have many different user stores. So they incorporate a MEDA directory as their centralized and single point of truth. This MEDA directory is often fed by the human resource management system. From the meta directory, users are being synchronized into each one of the other systems. This way, the whole life cycle of the user is driven from the meta directory. 
You will often hear the term realm or security domain when discussing claim-based access. A realm or security domain is basically the circle of trust. Within the realm, each component trusts each other, and claims are used to provide access to systems. But if you have multiple realms or security domains, by default, they do not have a trust between each other. So, users in realm B cannot make use of their claim issued by their local identity provider to gain access to applications in realm A. This is where federation comes into play. With federation, it is possible to establish trust between two different realms and thereby a user in realm B can access an application within realm A. Federation offers a great user experience. Users can use their own local identity provider for authentication and then seamlessly access applications in other realms. User administration is handled within each realm, which means if a user in realm B should no longer have access, the administrator of realm B disables the user. The administrator of realm A doesn't have to be told. The user will lose all access once disabled by the administrator in realm B. When federating between different realms, you often discuss the level of assurance. In other words, how much do I trust the other realms' processes, systems, users and administrators? If I know that in order for a user to be created in realm B, the user must provide proper means of identification and in order to authenticate, the user are prompted for multi-factor authentication. My level of assurance is quite high. But if a user can get a user account by simply filling in an anonymous form and are prompted for only username and password, my level of assurance is of course quite low. You can tie this to the fact that many claims include information about how the user was authenticated. So you may have a trust established between two different realms, but if the user is authenticated using a two-week of an authentication method, I may decide not to allow access. Many times I can redirect the user back to its home realm and in my redirect message request for a higher level of authentication. When you federate with many different entities, you must have a method of knowing the home realm of the user. This is often referred to as tenant discovery. You can argue tenant discovery is more when using a SaaS application who have many different tenants, and each tenant has its own federation configuration. But the principle is the same. A user connects directly to a resource, and the resource do not know if it should try to authenticate the user, or if it should redirect the user to someone else for authentication. Realm or tenant discovery is quite hard to automate. It often requires some kind of user interaction. Here is a couple of different variations of realm discovery prompts. Office 365 is well known by most people. In Office 365 you often perform tenant discovery by entering your email address. This tells Office 365 which tenant you belong to and thereby it knows the federation configuration. Other ways of performing tenant discovery are to simply offer a custom URL. Then each tenant has a unique URL that the user uses for access. Here's an example where both a custom URL and a user prompt is used. This tenant is configured for two different identity providers, one for employees and one for the externals. With Realm or tenant discovery, the system can now successfully redirect the user for authentication. Once authenticated, the user gets a claim that can be passed to the system for access. There are many different standards regarding claims, which means a claim can contain many different things. But as a bare minimum, a unique user identifier must be included. The claim is often signed so the receiving entity can verify the claim hasn't been tampered with. Nowadays, it becomes more and more common to encrypt the whole claim for further protection. In some claims, you have information about if the user managed to authenticate or not. This might sound weird, but you often use this to see if a user can perform a certain method of authentication or not. 
What method of authentication the user performed is also often passed in the claim. If I think the method is too weak, I can either prompt for another method myself or I can redirect the user back to perform a stronger method of authentication. Some standards are very flexible with the content of the claim, where others are very strict and minimalistic. But you can often see things like email address, first name, last name. You can pass things like roles and group membership in a claim. Sometimes you hear the word claim transformation. So here's two examples of claim transformation. In alternative one, I use one type of claim to gain access to an identity provider. In this case, I use Kerberos. Once authenticated, the identity provider sends me forward with a new kind of claim. This time it's SAML-based claim. Another way of viewing claim transformation is if you change the content of the claim. As an example, the user may authenticate using username and password and thereby authenticates into the identity provider as an individual. But the application may not need individual user separation. So the only thing that may be needed in the claim is group membership or the role employee of a certain company. You can build chains of federating entities. With each hop, the claim is terminated and a new claim is issued. A claim is never passed through a hop. In this example, the application only trusts the last identity provider in the chain. And lastly, just to clarify multi-factor authentication or MFA. MFA means you must prompt for at least two different factors. And the factors typically are something you know, like a password or a PIN, something you have, like a certificate on a smart card, or something you are, like your fingerprint. If you prompt twice for username and password, you are still only using one factor. So you haven't elevated your trust in the user's authentication method. The only result you gained was to annoy the users. With that, I thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. 